All of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Blessing. That's a blessing. Uh, that's my wife. She did good, doesn't she? Amen. Let's take our Bibles, turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter number three. Started this book uh, several weeks back and then had a kind of a break there, but we're uh, going to come back where we left off in Romans chapter three. I'd also like you to find a cross reference in James chapter two and Psalm 14. So we'll look at Romans chapter 3 with a cross reference there in James chapter 2 and Psalm 14. I want to welcome our online congregation. Uh, thank you for tuning in here at Bible Way on the Lord's Day. And I always uh, say hello and give a shout out to my sister and brother-in-law and uh, cousins and uncles and relatives around the country and our military families and missionaries around the world who listen to our services. We want to be a blessing to you. Uh, Romans chapter number 3 with a cross reference, James chapter 2 and Psalm uh, 14, Psalm 14. And uh, before I begin, it all it goes without saying uh, that uh, our hearts are, are extremely uh, uh, filled with gratitude for all of our people here at Bible Way over the years. We have touched a lot of people uh, over 37 years of ministry and continue to do so, and uh, we are thankful for um, for the people that God has given us. I know some pastors have a very difficult time pastoring uh, their people and their churches, and uh, sometimes it's very, very difficult and stressful for them uh, constantly. And we've had a few bumps and knocks along the way and a little bit of stress, but by and large, you've been a good people, and, uh, and, I, and I am so thankful for that. And hopefully, uh, you feel the same way about us. We've been a good pastor and pastor's wife, and uh, you've been a good people. When you get a team like that, it works. Yeah, you get a team like that, it works. Amen. 37 years, hard to believe. Uh, all right, Romans chapter number 3. I, I remember reading uh, a pastor's illustration about his son. And with uh, its tongue in his cheek, he said, Well, I happen to know a child who lives in my house, and I believe there's a pretty good chance that he will be a lawyer. Well, either he will be a lawyer or he will need a lawyer. <laughs> he has this ability to anticipate your objections and always comes ready with, his answers dad can I play video games today now before you say no you are going to say it is a school night and the rule is no video games until the weekend but I've been really good all week and and we are only 24 hours away from the weekend it practically is the weekend and you're going to ask, what about homework? But I've already finished my homework, and I already asked my teacher, and we aren't getting any homework tomorrow. And you know you always talk about grace, getting what we don't deserve. Don't you want to be like Jesus, Dad? Oh, playing the Jesus card, I thought, as he wrote. Sometimes, Pastor wrote, he said, sometimes I'll even say ahead of time, son, nothing you say will change my mind on this. Do you still want to give me your reasons? His answer is always yes. Well, this pastor's son, he does what Paul did up to this point in Romans. Like a good lawyer, as Paul built his argument for why we all need God's righteousness only available through believing the good news gospel of Jesus Christ Paul anticipated all of the objections in chapter 1 why do the Gentiles need the righteousness of God why do the Gentiles need the gospel he answered in chapter 1, because their rebellion against God's rule corrupted their hearts. In chapter 2, why do the Jews need the gospel? He anticipates an objection 
from religious Jews who say, yeah, those Gentiles, a bunch of pagans, they're messed up people, but not us. Uh -uh. No, we were raised on religion. We, we've got the word of God, the heroes of the faith, the temple. We are different. So Paul takes all of chapter 2 to show them and to show us religion does not solve our sin problem. Fact is, religion makes our problem worse. Since our problem at its core is an attitude of pride and rebellion and independence from God, religion can't help us. Making it worse by hiding under layers of exterior morality, religion actually caters to our sense of pride, rebellion, and independence from God. And then in the first eight verses of chapter 3, Paul anticipates another objection raised by his Jewish readers. Well, Paul, if Jews are not different, they asked, what was the purpose of Moses? What was the purpose of our law? And what was the purpose of our Jewish religion? And Paul responds, the law, the rituals, the sacrifices, they were designed not to give us something to master, to earn our place before God. No, they were designed to force us to the position where we would agree with the bad news of the Holy Bible. And so starting in verse 9, like a good lawyer building on what he's already said, Paul gives us the bad news. Would you look at Romans chapter 3 and verse number 9? They say, okay, what's the bottom line? What then? What is the bottom line? Tell me, tell me, the, just give me, Give me the, the short, the long and the short. Just tell me what then. Are we Jews better than them Gentiles? No. In no wise. For we have before proved in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of this letter, this epistle, both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin so the conclusion of, of chapters 1 and 2 and the first few verses first eight verses of chapter 3 the conclusion is that sin makes Gentiles and Jews equals okay now now Paul does not mean that everyone commits the same amount of sin as everyone else or that every sin is equal in degree or effect but here's the bad news. Here's the really, really bad news report from the Bible. The level of our sin, whether it's just a little bit of sin or whether it's a whole lot of sin, the level of our sin is irrelevant. This is where I want you to see that cross-reference in James chapter 2. Look in James chapter 2 and verse number 10. For whosoever shall keep the whole law. If you're going to try and get to heaven by letting your good outweigh your bad or try to do enough good to offset your bad and, and God lets you in, you know, if you're going to try and keep the whole law, you've got to remember this one terrible bad news point. If you offend in one point, just one slip, one lie, one stray bad thought, one lust, one, uh, one covet, then you, before the holy, holy, holy God, you become guilty of every law in the book. One slip, and you become guilty of all. Now, I'm going to put that in monopoly terms, okay? In monopoly terms, we do not get out of jail. We do not pass go, and we do not collect $200. Give me an amen. It's bad news. Black, white, young, old, men, women, 
tucked shirt, untucked shirt. <laughs> okay? Despicable murderer. Our sweet old grandmama. All are sinners. All are sinners. Now, now when Paul writes all under sin, he's speaking here in military and legal terms. Look back at verse number 9, Romans chapter 3, verse number 9. What then, what's the conclusion, what's the bottom line here, Paul? Are we Jews better than they Gentiles? Are we better than them? Or us religious folks, are we better than those who don't have any religion at all? And he said, no. No. No way. No and no wise. For we've before proved that both religious people and non-religious people, Jews and Gentiles, that they are all, they are all under sin. See, we are all under sin's authority and sin's power and sin's control like soldiers under the command of superior officers. That's what he means in that military picture in that word. Also, we all stand legally, this is the legal part of this word, legally under sin's condemnation, sentence, and judgment. Is bad news. Spiritually speaking, we are all incarcerated by sin with no chance for an appeal. Jew, Gentile, we are all hopelessly lost in sin. And there are no degrees. Okay, there are no degrees of lostness. Say you and I, we decide that we're going to swim nonstop from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina to London, England. You and I decide we're going to make that swim nonstop. One of us, one of us will make it further than the other. I don't mean to brag, but it's likely me because I was on the swim team. Okay? But it might be you, if you're younger. But on this swim, from Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, or swimming in the Atlantic to London, England, on this swim, no matter how far each of us get toward London, there's something that's going to be guaranteed. It's guaranteed we will both drown or get eaten by sharks. That's guaranteed. Okay? Either way, we are both in the same condition. Doesn't matter. I, I, I swam. I swam another quarter mile farther than you did. It doesn't matter that you got a little ahead of me. We are both in the same condition, dead in the water. We both need the same help. We both need the same lifeboat. We both need the same rescue. And that's a picture of us trying to get to heaven on our own. Okay? Some of us can go a little farther. Some of us can be a little better. Some of us can be a little nicer than the other guy. But we are both seriously, seriously failing to make it to glory. In our standing before God, sin makes Jews and Gentiles equal. And that's just the beginning of the bad news. Scripture requires, okay, the Bible, God's Word, requires agreement with the bad news. We are sinners before we can believe the good news and be safe. Give me an amen. So the conclusion, sin makes Gentiles and Jews equal. The evidence in every area, every area, we are both sin saturated. We are saturated, saturated with sin in our character, in our mind, in our heart. Once you look at verse number 10 now. 
Look at verse number 10, Romans chapter 3. As it is written, he starts quoting the Old Testament, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understands. There is none that seeks after God. They are all gone out of the way. The prophet Isaiah would say, all we like sheep have gone astray. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that does good. No, not one. Now, in these and the coming verses, Paul quotes from six Old Testament passages. He leaves no basis for Jewish readers to say, Paul, objection, your teaching that Jews are sinners just like Gentiles, that contradicts the Old Testament. <laughs> no, he pulls the props out of that thought. Because the Jews of Paul's day, and actually for centuries, that the Jews had thought and they, they truly believed that just because they were the biological descendants of Abraham, they were Jewish, that their ticket for forgiveness of sin and heaven was in the bag. They, they really believed that. But you know what? Similarly, most of us Gentiles today... This is what you talk to somebody and you just meet them on the street, you meet them out somewhere at Walmart or something, you ask them and you ask them, say, say, when you die, why do you think you're going to get to go to heaven or do you think you're going to get to go to heaven? They say, oh, absolutely, I'm going to heaven. Why? Well, I think my good outweighs my bad. You know, I've never killed nobody. I've tried to pay my bills, tried to be nice, put a little, you know, put a little money down there at the church house and showed up every once in a while. And, and you just go through all these lists of all the things you tried to do in swimming to London, England. And you find out that it does not work. Paul is about to bust their balloon as well as our balloon okay now when when God looks down from heaven and he looks on all of humankind including us the standard that he uses to evaluate our life all of us Jews and Gentiles is his own sinless holy perfection now, Paul actually quotes Psalm 14. This is where I want you to see this cross-reference, and you'll begin to see these familiar-sounding words. Look in Psalm 14. Look back at Psalm 14 and verse number 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, if you look carefully in your Bibles, in your English Bibles, the, the two words, there is, are, are uh, italicized and that that indicates that the translators inserted those they're not an original Hebrew uh, but they they inserted it that they thought would help make uh, a good sense and, and it would help make a, a better understanding <clears throat> and, and, it, it, and it does but let's take those two italicized words out and and see if it sounds a little different the fool has said in his heart no God talking to God he's saying no now continue verse 1 they are corrupt they have done abominable works there is none that does good well that sounds like Romans 3 the Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand yeah, there's none that understands that's Romans or seek after God there there's that's that was repeated in Romans they are all gone aside astray that was in Romans they are all together become filthy there is none that does good say those three words with me people no not one again no not one so we come back to to um, to Romans chapter 3 and we see the final three words of verse 10 and the final three words of verse 12 they answer the big question is there anyone Jew or Gentile 
who sinlessly is perfect inside and outside. And what's the answer? Say those three words. No, not one. Not one. So we're saturated with sin in our character, in our mind, in our heart. We're saturated with sin in our lips. Look at verse 13 now, Romans chapter 3. Verse number 13. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. So in these two verses, Paul quotes three more psalms. Well, we're not going to take a look. Time, we don't have time to take a look at them, but Psalm 5, Psalm 140, and Psalm 10. He's quoting the Old Testament. And by quoting these psalms, Paul is demonstrating how sin infects various parts of our human body, Jews and Gentiles, starting with our organs of speech. Now, one author wrote, why do you think Paul spends so much time describing our organs of speech? He answers, because sin is seen most often in our words. Jesus himself said, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. So whatever's in our heart eventually comes out. One paraphrase renders the first part of verse 13. Their talk is foul and filthy like the stench of an open grave. See, our speech has the smell of death about it because spiritually speaking, nothing but death is inside of us. Is this why we talk about dirty jokes and gutter language? Is it a coincidence that so many of our dirty words have to do with human excrement and perverted sex? Is this not a reflection of the decay inside the human heart? Why do we love dirty talk and Double entendres, which is words or phrases that are open to two interpretations, one of which usually is risque or indecent. Why do children love trash talk? He writes, because spiritually, inside our heart is a rotting corpse, and the stench of it comes out of our mouths. And this is only part of Paul's bad news theological point to which we are required to agree. Okay? We are saturated with sin in our character, our mind, and our heart. We're saturated with sin in our lips. We are saturated with sin in our feet. Would you look at verse 15 of Romans chapter 3? Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. And the way of peace have they not known. Now these three verses change from the inward decay to the outward actions that we take or that we corporately take as a country or as a people. Look back in at verse number 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Now between January 22nd, 1973 when the Supreme Court invented a right in the Constitution for mothers to kill their unborn babies, and June 24th, 2022, 49 years later, when the Supreme Court wrote that their previous 1973 decision was egregiously wrong, damaging, and an abuse of judicial authority, the reported number... 
459,781 yet-to-be-born children were executed in their mother's womb or shortly thereafter. What, whatever happened to legal, safe, and rare? 63 million. Now, if a child in the womb is no different than a diseased appendix, then no justification for abortion is necessary. I mean, there's no discussion. Just cut it out. But if a child is different than a diseased appendix, if a child is an innocent human life, then no justification for abortion is adequate. Luke chapter 1 recounts six month in utero John the Baptist. He leaped in his mother Elizabeth's womb in the presence of Mary whose womb, the human body of Jesus, was just a zygote new, newly implanted by the Holy Spirit. That tells the Bible is clear. It's a baby in there, not a diseased appendix, wart, or growth. Can I have a witness? Say amen. Apologist Greg Kokel, he wrote, No moral issue. No political issue, no human rights issue has greater significance in the 21st century than abortion. The abortion question is not ultimately, it doesn't come down to uh, privacy or freedom or economic hardship or complexity or not being wanted or forcing morality. No, the real question is, what is the unborn. What is the yet to be born? Now, answering that one simple question is going to clear up all the moral fog around abortion. God, who judged Israel for killing its children, they, they would leave, if you got a baby girl they would take it out to the landfill and leave her out there to die because they wanted a son and not a girl. They would take their unwanted infant children and throw them into the open belly of a metal idol that was stoked with fire and burn those children to death. And God who judged Israel for killing its children, judges America for the same. Now I want you to look at verse 16. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. So we're, we are sin-saturated in our character, in our mind, in our heart, in our lips, in our feet. And we are sin saturated in our eyes. Look at verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 18, a paraphrase. They care nothing about God or what he thinks about them. See, when, when the Bible says no fear of God, that simply means living as if God does not exist. Carrying on in our lives as if God does not exist. So we ignore God's ways, we flout his commands, we disregard his word, and we violate his statutes. Now listen, bad news, we are obliged to agree, this is us. This is us. We all are sinners. This is a, some to a little lesser, some to a greater, but we are all, so this is us. And the scripture requires, requires agreement with the bad news that we are sinners before we can believe the good news and be safe. So the conclusion 
Sin makes Gentiles and Jews equals. The evidence in every area, we are both sin-saturated. And then the finding, as Paul continues here, the finding is keeping commandments and doing good deeds does nothing to change our sinfulness. Look at this, verse 19. Verse 19. Now we know that what things soever the law, God's law in the Old Testament says, it says to them who are under the law, specifically the Jewish people there, so that, to them and to everyone, so that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deep, based on all of this, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. So Gentile and Jew alike, they're accused, they're prosecuted, they're found guilty, and they are sentenced by the law of God, period. All the quotations of Paul from God's law, the Old Testament, they lead to one big thought. All the world is guilty before God. No ifs, no buts, no ands. Verse 19, now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth in this world, past, present, and future, may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. It was commentator Warren Wiersbe, he wrote, there is no debate or defense. The whole world is guilty, Jews and Gentiles. The Jews stand condemned by the law which they boast about, Romans 2. And the Gentiles stand condemned on the basis of creation, God's revelation of himself in creation, and their, the law of God written on their conscience. And that's Romans chapter 1. But you know what? Telling people they are sinners, that does not sit well with our therapists. Or our culture. Our culture at this point is picked up on this thought. A church telling people that they are sinners is toxic theology. And it's meant to hurt and control and manipulate people. In a TikTok post, over a million views, little videos, an apostate Christian who rejected her faith, she explains a toxic relationship is abusive. And this is what she says. The abuser will break down the victim's self-worth and self-esteem and make them feel broken and worthless without them so that they'll be dependent on the abuser. Then the video flashes to her playing the part of a faithful Christian responding with, Oh, yeah, man, that's, that's really horrible that people do that. Then it flashes back again to the apostate, and she says, Right. So then, when a church teaches you that you're born broken and a sinner and worthy of eternal punishment, it's... And then it flashes back to her playing the faithful Christian. 
true. We're, we're all sinners unworthy of what Jesus did for us. Flashback to the playing the apostate, and she says, okay, I'm going to start from the beginning, and you let me know where I lost you. And people get their theology from TikTok. Okay, videos like this appeal to the emotions. They, they use a false comparison and are so short, this one's 27 seconds, it stops anyone from analyzing the video too closely or too carefully. Would you look back again at verse number 19? Now we know that what things soever the law says, it says to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be come guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. So the question comes up, is my Romans 3 preaching today that you are a sinner, is that equivalent to me being an abuser trying to control you as a victim? One author used this illustration. Imagine a scenario in which someone recognizes that a particular person is broken and then proceeds to beat on that individual's chest forcefully causing deep bruising. Is this just their toxic way of trying to control the other person or beat them into submission? Well, if that's the case, many would call that abuse. And we would too. Unless the person pounding on the other one's chest is trained in CPR and the chest they're pounding on lodges a heart that has stopped beating. That changes the narrative, doesn't it? In that case, the broken person will die without intervention and the person performing the chest compressions is saving their life. However, if someone were to tell a perfectly healthy person that they were broken and then proceeded to pound on their chest cavity, an observer wouldn't call the hospital first, they'd call the police first. But to refer to the Bible's teaching of original sin as toxic, that, that makes no sense. That makes no sense at all. Or it only makes sense if it's not true. But it is true. The good news gospel which teaches us that we are all sinners is the cure. Give me a witness, say amen. It's the cure. Now, I'm just going to take a side note here. Just kind of bear with me. I want us to remember that the Bible and Bible-believing churches and every preacher worth his salt teaches that every human, including those in the womb, are made in the image of God. Made in the image of likeness of God. And the image of God in us makes us all, all of us, to have a personal, inherent dignity and value and worth. We are worthy because we're created in the image of God. We are worth, Jesus said, we are, one person is worth all of this world put together. We're that valuable. The Bible teaches that. Bible-believing churches teach that. Preachers worth their salt preach that. So we don't say we're just a bunch of dirt, a bunch of worms. 
No, we are made in the image of God. But spiritually, we are all sinners. And we need a Savior. Can I have an amen? Now this is the middle of Paul's argument here. But original sin teaches that we've all inherited a sin nature from Adam. And that sin nature contaminates us and twists us towards sin. However, as we're going to continue, God willing, our journey through Romans, we're going to discover that there is a cure for our bad news sin problem. Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross is the solution. I mean, amen. And helping people understand their spiritual need. That we are all sinners. That is both a healthy and loving thing to do. Because it's the truth. It's the truth as revealed in God's Word. It is unhealthy and unloving to tell people that they are perfect just the way you are. They're not perfect in the sight of a holy God. We are all guilt-saturated sinners. And Scripture requires agreement. Agreement with God about this. Scripture requires agreement with the bad news that we are sinners before we can believe the good news and be safe. Let's stand. There we head bowed, nice, eyes closed. You in our online congregation, if you'll also join us in an attitude of prayer. The words of this bad news passage, they apply to you. They apply to you whether you admit it or not. Now, not all are equally sinful, but all of us are equally sinners. To a greater or lesser degree, all sin, including you. To be forgiven by Christ, you need to shut your mouth and stop arguing with God about what a good person you are. Your first requirement is to recognize, admit, acknowledge, and agree that you are a sinner. And once you've humbled yourself to agree with God's Word, then you are ready to receive and believe the good news cure of Jesus' gospel. Now you can pray in your pew if you'd like, but we believe that by physically stepping forward and seeking God at the altar of prayer, you'll help solidify your spiritual decision. Also, a prayer partner from our church can join you, pray with you and for you, and if you choose, can show you from the Bible how the guilt and stains of your sin can be washed away. You come. If you're online, you can message our media people. Or maybe you have family members, loved ones, or friends, co-workers that you know do not see their sin. They don't see their need for Jesus. They don't see their, their sin condition. Would you come and pray for them that God will do whatever it takes for them to realize their sins must have His forgiveness to enter into heaven. Would you come and pray? What number do we have, Brother Robert? 344. Let God speak to your heart. Marvelous grace of our loving Lord, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was slain. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon. Yeah.
Amen. It's been good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. It's kind of a bad news message with a good side. We haven't got to just yet, really fully, but we will. I promise. Romans is going to be uh, opening up uh, to all of the good things that God has done to help us get out of the bad jam that we are in when we're sinners. But that'll be coming, Lord willing, the days ahead. Tonight, tonight's service, the three-word creed of God's church. Very important. We know the three-word creed of God's church. I'd like you to come back tonight, 6 o'clock hour for worship and the Word of God. Invite our online congregation to tune in at 6 o'clock. But if you cannot, we hope to see you back here next Lord's Day at Bible Way. God bless you.